Hey, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are in the world, to include New Zealand. Welcome to the Chapman Co. Leadership Institute. This is a webinar on the formula for feedback that works, uh, changing the way we think about uh, delivering feedback and also helping your team. We're going to get started, and the first thing I want to do is just a very, very quick introduction. I Trust me, I know a lot of these webinars, they go this huge sales process, about 15 minutes on this is what we do. You're not going to get that from us. You're going to get about 30 seconds on what we do. But I do want to begin just to orient us to the actual webinar itself. And we'll start by letting you know a little bit about myself. I'm one of the partners here at Chapman & Co. Leadership Institute. I have a background in the U.S. military as an officer and did a variety of different uh, roles. But notably, and especially for this one, is a lot of that time was spent working with a variety of different teams, a variety of cultures, and doing a lot of leadership development. So that's a little bit about my background. I've been doing this type of consulting work with organizations around the world for about the last six years. I'm going to be asking, this is going to be very interactive. So I'm going to be putting some polls up for you to answer questions, and I'll be sharing those with you. The chat function at the bottom of your screen, you'll see chat, raise hand, and one other one. I have Maria Olivos here helping me out. And that last function they're going to tell me about is chat raise hand and Q&A. So at any moment during this entire presentation, if you have a question, just put it in the Q&A. It'll come up, I'll answer any question, and there are no dumb questions, but there are questions that I will judge. Anyway, put it in the Q&A. Um, also use that chat function however you like, and there's gonna be times that I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand uh, to vote, and I'd like you to do that as well. So if you have any questions at all, please let me know. I know most of you are like, I'd love to talk, I'd love to talk, but with the number of people that we have on, we're going to keep uh, you muted for the majority of it, and at the end, if we have some Q&A, we can release that. I think that's all I have for the orientation. I'm gonna get into a little bit about this actual webinar. And first of all, where would rock and roll be without feedback? So David Gilmore, he's a famous guitarist, I love his quote, right? I know it's not the feedback we're talking about, but David Gilmore was a guitarist for he was a guitarist for the Who, the Beatles, and there's one, there's one other band I'm forgetting. He was Who, the Beatles, and help me out in the chat box. Who is he also a guitarist for? Any David Gilmore fans out there? I know I already went on first concerts, and no one is answering me, so I'm going to have to answer myself. David Gilmore, I think it was the Who, uh, the Beatles, and Pink Floyd. All right, so where would rock and roll be without feedback? But that is not what we're talking about. Very quickly about the organization. So I work for Chapman and Company Leadership Institute. We do everything from assessments, both uh, leadership 360s to organizational culture surveys. We do leadership development from senior teams to frontline leaders. We have training courses. We have a great course on inclusion, a very different way about rethinking diversity and inclusion in the workspace. We do workshops and keynotes, and of course we do that consulting, everything from bringing your senior team together for your annual conference to the entire organization. We structure those. That's the work that we do, and that's the end of the entire sales pitch. I'm not kidding. I'm not even going to hit you with anything at the end. I do want to let you know, though, where we come from. Chapman & Company Leadership Institute is named after Bob Chapman, our CEO, who was the inspiration behind a lot of this work. I actually come from a parent company called Barry Waymiller, about a $3 billion global firm around the entire world, about 200 locations worldwide from China all the way over uh, to the U.S., North America, a lot of uh, sites in Europe, so a lot of what we're going to talk about works in all these different cultures. We actually build capital goods manufacturing equipment, and so anything you might find in a supermarket, a grocery store, it's been uh, packaged, seamed, filled, capped, conveyed, palletized. A lot of the cardboard and aluminum cans we use in the world all come from one of our machines. And I mentioned about 200 locations worldwide, but where we actually really got a lot of the uh, notoriety is in all of these acquisitions we've done. So we've done about 106 of them. And we don't assimilate different cultures. We integrate those, taking the best of both worlds. I put the bottom right slide down there just to give you an idea about uh, the game of business that we play. We don't shy away from the fact that we are a profitable organization. We're privately held. But we're about 16% increase in share price for the last oh, the years since 1987. Uh, it's been very profitable, a very strong growth organization. And feedback, this feedback that we're going to show you is one of the tools that we use to drive organic growth and to unleash the potential of all of our team members, both recognition for what they do well and developmental feedback for what they can change. And I know I'm on feedback right now, so I want to just, let's level set and I want to get some questions from you. So I'm going to give you a couple of questions here. 
And these questions are going to be on feedback themselves. So the first one I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you, what percent of employees say they would literally work harder if they felt their efforts were better recognized? In other words, they were getting feedback on what they were doing right. What percent of employees do you think said they would work harder if they felt their efforts were being better recognized? I'm just going to give us a few seconds. I know we've got about, oh, 36 or 37 people on right now. So when I get a majority here, I'm just going to call it and then I'm going to share with you what the people said. All right, I'm going to share these results with you. A good majority of you said 69%. A good majority of you said 91%. Those of you that said 91%, you are in fact incorrect. It is 69% of people said, and that was mean, I'm sorry. It was 69% of people said they would literally work hard just if their efforts were being recognized. All right, next question. Next question, question number two, what percent of respondents agreed with this, that negative or redirecting feedback, if delivered appropriately, is effective at improving performance? So what percent of respondents agreed that if you get redirect feedback, if it's delivered appropriately, it will be effective at improving performance? I'm just gonna pause for a second here while you all vote on this. And it's good because we get an idea about the power, I think, of feedback directly from people who are receiving that. In this case, the majority of you are saying that it was 73%. The actual answer on this one, those of you that voted 92%, you are correct. 92% of people said, if you give me negative or redirecting feedback, if it's delivered appropriately, it will improve my performance. All right, next one we're going to do. Question number three here on feedback. What percent of Gen Y, what percent of Gen Y said they prefer on-the-spot recognition over a formal review? What percent of Gen Y said they prefer on-the-spot recognition over formal reviews? I'll give it a moment for you all to vote. And I know right now you're thinking, well, when's the last time I had a really good formal review? As we look at these stats and what you're voting on here, the vast majority of you are saying, it is 80 per 90%. In this case, 80%, 80% of Gen Y said they prefer on the spot recognition over formal reviews. Uh, just a couple more here as we start to begin this. What percent of HR execs believe performance reviews are not an accurate representation of employee performance? So in this case, you might even be thinking about your own last performance review and think, well, was it accurate of mine? So what percent of HR execs believe performance reviews aren't an accurate representation of employee performance? I'm going to share this result with you as well. Uh, you are correct. 77% of HR execs believe performance reviews aren't an accurate representation of employee performance. In other words, I'm giving feedback that actually is not correct. Hey, last question here, and we'll get into this. Is, you've heard this phrase before, feedback is a gift, true or false? Feedback is a gift, true or false? Wow, none of you are writing false. I have a lot of people voting true. Feedback is a gift, true. What if the feedback is not helpful? What if the feedback is wrong? Is it still a gift? We're gonna get into that. And I'm gonna come back to this question later on, but I want us to think about that statement and how a feedback is a gift. Well, I don't know, why don't we give it more often? Why don't we take it in and receive it even better? I'm gonna share with you what those results were. All of you that voted, 24 of you, thank you, voted 100% on feedback being a gift. We'll get into a little bit about that. All right, back into the performance. So first one here is, what's the goal of giving feedback? And I'm gonna ask this, we're gonna jump into this. I'm gonna ask the poll question again, and in this case, I am going to ask you the question on the poll. What's the goal of giving feedback? So do me a favor, just vote right there where you think the goal of giving feedback is. And that's the way we'll begin this little session. Is the goal of giving feedback to change behavior? Is it to give advice? Is it a way to really document poor performance? Does it allow the leader to vent? A lot of you are voting change behavior. A couple of you are voting uh, give advice, document poor performance. Um, in this case, when we think about giving feedback, I want someone to do more of something. I probably want someone to perhaps slightly do different or perhaps it needs to be a real big change. Regardless, what I'm really looking for is someone to change their behavior. I, as especially as a leader or as a teammate or as a colleague, I want someone to change what they are doing. And so in this case, 
the reason we give feedback is to change behavior. Um, giving advice is a little bit something a little separate, and we can get into that later on. You can ask a question on that. We're documenting perf poor performance. The first piece of this is I'm literally trying to get you to do something different. And I'll share these results with you and how it all turned out when you voted. And as you can see, change in behavior, that is correct. That's the reason why uh, we give feedback. All right, so if that's the goal of giving it, then if I want people in my span of care to do more or do better or do different, basically to change, then I need to create the environment in which the message can be received. Now, I notice I use the phrase people in my span of care. Um, a leader, their job is to care for the people that uh, are working, and so therefore you won't hear us say things like the people, my direct reports, or the people that are in my direct span of control, because I don't control people. My job is to care for them. So that's a language piece, and I just want to call that out. Span of care. I want them to change, but I need to create an environment. All right, I'm going to orient you to, um, I'm going to orient you to this little block here. And so on the top left, uh, if you look at the X and Y axis, so the Y axis here is care personally, simple two by two graph, how I care about someone. And the more I care about someone, increase up. And then challenge directly. In other words, I have the courage to challenge or to tell the truth or to challenge directly is on the x-axis moving to the right. On the top left is sugarcoat. Like I'm going to say it gently. I'm going to be very nice about it. I hope you get the truth. But I'm just going to, all I'm going to do is I'm going to sugar, I'm going to sugarcoat and say it very gently. The top right is truth with care. In other words, I care about you personally, but I'm also going to have the courage to challenge you directly, tell the truth, even if it's tough. The bottom right is aggressive. In other words, I'm, I don't know that I care about you at all. I'm just going to tell you what I think. And the very bottom left is just absolutely say nothing. So I have a few questions for you. Question number one is where do you want to receive feedback from? In this case, I'm going to ask you that question in a poll question. Where do you want feedback from? And I'm giving you the option here to say you can select say nothing. You can sugarcoat it. You can give me truth with care. Or we can just have it as being very, very aggressive. I am going to share these results with you and show you that the vast majority of you in case in this case, um, all of you uh, voted, I want truth of care. That's where I want the feedback from. I know it seems very simple here, but there's a reason I'm leading us through this. So let me ask you the next question. The next question is, if that's the case, then tell me where do you default to giving feedback at work? So where do you default? What area do you default? When you think about your workspace, maybe your previous role, the role you're in right now, be really honest here, and I'm not, none of these are traceable back who said what. I want you to tell me truthfully, first gut reaction, where do you default to giving feedback at work? Like if I were to shift from somewhere, I'd be like, I'd like to say I give truth of care, but I'm probably a little more on the aggressive side and sometimes say nothing. So I probably mix around between those two. I'm going to show you what you all said here on this one. All right, so I asked you how you share it at work, and these are the responses you gave. Um, some of you said, hey, I, I say nothing at all. Um, a good portion of you, actually the majority of you, thank you for your honesty, you said, I, I sugarcoat and hope they can just kind of find out what I'm trying to say. And they should actually know better. There's a portion that said, no, I actually give it truth of care. And there's a portion of you like me that are a little more aggressive. All right, last question I'm going to ask you on this. If that's the case, then let me ask you, where do you default to giving feedback to family and or friends? To family and our friends, where do you default to giving feedback? Where do you default to giving feedback? Do you say nothing? Do you sugarcoat? Is it truth with care? Is it more aggressive? How would you differ from that? Just a few more seconds here as you put your votes in. All right, let me share with you what you're saying on this one. And what's interesting is as soon as I went to family and our friends, the truth with care increased above where you said with work. Uh, also, aggressiveness increased. <laughs> it sounds like you care a lot and you're going to be aggressive. And the sugarcoating uh, increased a little bit as well. This is what's interesting. So do me a favor. In the chat room, if you don't mind, in the chat room, could you just give me some reasons? Why do you think and what actually causes um, the discrepancy? So in this case, there's a discrepancy in where I default to giving it where I want it from, where I default to giving it at work, and where the feedback. So what drives the discrepancy between the groups? So if you don't mind, maybe just in the chat room there, just tell me and if you don't mind, uh, when you um, comment in a chat, make sure you've clicked on and it says, when you're gonna write something, it clicks on and it says, all panelists and attendees. 
so everybody can see, if you don't mind, just a couple of chats real quick on where do you default to giving feedback? Why does it, what drives the discre discrepancy? Okay, relationships, uh, level of connection or compassion, it's interesting. Discrepancy is due to familiarity or comfort level with recipient, experience, um, sometimes aggressive because I know it comes from love, okay? Level of love, age, experience, family and friend, the environment of trust and respect, the comfort with the person. Here's what's interesting. When I ask you, um, where do you want feedback? 100% of you said, I want feedback at the intersection between caring personally and challenging directly. I just want the truth, but I want to know you give a damn about me as a person. As soon as I start asking, well, how do you give feedback? I have a whole bunch of context. Well, at work, what about this person that could damage a relationship? And do I know this person? Here's the interesting part. We do this work all over the world. And what we find is everyone, just about everyone, occasionally you find people who are like, oh, just give it to me easy. I'll take the sugar coating. Occasionally you find a few people who are like, no, no, I want it aggressive. The vast majority in the 90, high 90 percentile, they want truth with care. And so the first part of this is I understand there are a lot of reasons why you're not doing it or what might be professional or how familiar I am with the person. But in the end, the vast majority of human beings want feedback that occurs like the person cares about me and they're telling me the truth. So we're going to give you a formula that allows you to do that more often. Before I get into that, though, I want to show you some work. This is work by uh, loosely based on Kim Scott's work. So Kim Scott wrote the book. Radical Candor, and she was with Google for a number of uh, number of years. A great book, and one of the people on our team at the Chapman & Co. Leadership Institute is actually getting a doctorate uh, in her work and does a lot of work with her team. And so while the language has changed slightly, I want to orient you to is almost a heat map of your receptivity of the feedback you're going to give. I'm sugarcoating, just kind of gentle, so I would give you an example. Um, my mother is somebody who both gives feedback as sugarcoating and I give it to her as, as that same way. My brother and I were both in the military and when we were deployed, when we would call home, she would ask how it's going and we knew our answer was, it's going just fine, mom, it's okay. And when she calls us, we know we have to ask a whole bunch of times to actually understand, is something wrong? And so my mom is one that kind of sugarcoats that. Um, aggressive on the hard end, that's just like, I'm, I don't know if I care about your person, I'm just gonna constantly be challenging you. And the truth with care, as you can see in the heat map here, that's the most receptivity of this. Um, I'll give you an example of where sugar coating actually doesn't work out very well. Um, I have a daughter and she plays, uh, she plays soccer. And she plays midfield, and as those of you know, in soccer or football, depending on where you are in the world, the midfield is kind of controls the game between defense and offense a lot of times. And she had a pretty poor game during the finals, and she has kind of a poor game. And they lose, and they're still in the tournament with the finals, so the next day we're getting ready to play. And, you know, being the dad, I'm going to give her the good, you know, it's going to be okay, we're going to do a great job. And so I'm giving her the pep talk. Hey, you know, you're well-fed, you're well-trained, you're going to go out there, you're going to have a great game, et cetera, et cetera, pretty much sugarcoating everything. So I give her that, and I come back to the sidelines, and my wife says, uh, what did you say? And I gave her the whole thing. I said, well, you know, I told her she's great. She's going to have a good game. And my wife says, well, that's not very helpful. Does she know that she actually didn't play very well yesterday? And the reason that they, when she didn't play well, the team didn't exactly win. I said, no, I didn't. Tell her. We need to go out there and tell her that. So it's like the reverse walk of shame. I'm out there. All, the kids are all getting ready to play. And here I am, my teenage daughter, and I'm walking out there. And so I stop and my, you can see my daughter's looking around like, please do not be coming up here to talk to me. What are you doing? I see her looking like, what are you doing? We're about to start the game. So I come out to her and she goes, what do you want? And I said, well, your mom asked me to tell you. And then I gave her the feedback. And she's like, yep, you're right. I know I'm going to have, you know, I'm, I got it. We're going to have a great game. So the point was me being on the soft side of this wasn't helpful whatsoever. And she could really handle that truth. It just in a heat map. And I understand that some of you be like, no, no, no. I need to give it more aggressively for some people or sugarcoating. Just remember, none of us wanted to provide context when I asked you how you wanted it received to you, given to you. As soon as I started asking about family or group or work, now I start to have context with it. I'm gonna give you a formula that allows you to give that truth with care mark. Um, really, it's about creating the environment. And if I want someone to change their behavior, I'm literally trying uh, to create an environment that they can motivate themselves. I know there's a lot of science behind this. I know there might be a lot of, well, you know, we just need to motivate people to do a better job or do something different. And the truth is you can't do that. 
um, as in the military, this is a little of the dark side, I'll give you a light side, but in the harder edge of this, in the military during our special forces or our, some of our senior more leadership type of positions, during our training, there'd always be an opportunity we would have for people. Uh, I want to know whether people will want to be there for the right reasons. This isn't a story about military, it's just a story about people. And so in training, what we use is we use temperature, hunger, and, and sleep. And so when you're tired, you're hungry, and you're cold, that's when uh, we're going to give you an out and say, here's an opportunity. We have a great, nice, warm hotel room and a bed, warm, everything. It's just, why don't you just, you want to quit? I'm not telling people to quit. I'm just creating a different environment for them to say, yeah, actually I, I do. And the, the purpose wasn't to get them to leave. It was just to create a different environment to see who actually wanted to be there. On the good side of this, can't motivate another person. You can only create the environment in which they motivate themselves. So it's a very real example. Uh, my vehicle, the car I drive, it is not for sale. If you want to uh, wire me through, uh, um, I don't know, one of the programs, you can just send cash, whether it's PayPal or whatever. If you want to send me two times its blue book value on PayPal, suddenly my car is sold and you have got a set of keys in your hands on its way via FedEx. And you didn't change anything. You didn't motivate me to do anything. You just changed the environment. So if we want to change the environment in which feedback is received, because I want them to literally change, then I have to create the right environment for that. It's three steps. Step number one is I need to ask for feedback first. Step number two, deliver it in a way it can be received. And step number three, the ratio needs to be more affirmative to developmental. I'm going to jump into these. First of all, David Rock, uh, one of, another one of our uh, folks at the, on staff here at the Leadership Institute is uh, certified with the Neuro Leadership. And David Rock has this great quote about asking for feedback. It's less threatening for both sides. In other words, who the person is and who the leader is. People can ask for feedback as often as they like. Employees can solicit from multiple people throughout the organization and really get more accurate and valuable feedback on their performance. Even by asking, they can get the very specific feedback they need. All right, nice factual, almost academic statement. Here's the cool science behind this. Um, I asked you about is feedback a gift and you all said yes. And what I would offer is feedback actually isn't the gift, especially if it's not delivered in a way that you understand it or can act on it. The actual gift is asking for feedback. So on the top left corner up here, this is an actual uh, human brain, uh, frontal view and side view, and it shows those, those red dots there. Those are the areas in your mind associated with receiving a reward, whether that be cash or input or, um, or uh, uh, in this case, asking for an opinion. Those are the areas associated with what happens when I get a reward. Right below that, those yellow markers and the two yellow arrows are showing you the same area. Those same areas show neural activity when I ask somebody for their feedback, I ask for their input, I ask for opinions. Literally asking someone for feedback and asking for them on their opinion of something is a reward. And if we think about this, it makes sense. You're valuing me, my thoughts, my intellect, my ability to present something to the, to the organization uh, just by asking me. The other part that happens is you display the leadership characteristic of listening because it forces you to say, I'm interested in your feedback, now someone's talking and you're listening to it. So number one in creating the right environment, remember I want someone to change. So number one is I'm gonna create a pathway of that care and the way I do that is by valuing them, by asking them for their feedback. All right, uh, next one, deliver the feedback in a way it can be received. Deliver it in a way it can be received. In this case, we're gonna use this formula, situation, behavior, and impact. All three of these things need to be present. I don't care what order they are, and the more specific we can be, the better it is for the recipient. This is the formula, situation, behavior, and impact. So let's jump into this. I'm gonna show you what a formula looks like the wrong way, and one that's much more specific using all three of those. So incorrect example. Thomas, you are always late to meetings. It's rude and not fair to the people who made it on time. The problem is I'm a little bit vague, uh, I'm judgmental in the rude thing and a little bit inapplicable. I don't know what to do with this. The correct example would be this. Thomas, during the Monday morning meeting each week, that's the situation, you often arrive late. It's just a behavior. You often arrive late. As a result, here's the impact. We miss out on your thoughts and often have to repeat agenda items. The impact allows the context, and in this case, you can see it's both about I value your thoughts and I miss out on them and we miss out and have to repeat agenda items. Those are the two examples. So I'd like you to think of someone that you could give feedback to and not necessarily developmental. 
not just necessarily developmental. In other words, if I wanted to tell someone they were doing a good job, instead of saying great job, I can also use the exact same formula, situation, behavior, impact. And by using those three aspects, I can give affirmative feedback, what you did, what the behavior was, what the impact was. So I want you to think of someone you'd like to give feedback to. Now I want you to think about in what situation does the behavior occur? In what situation does the behavior occur? In this case, I want you to think about is it in specific scenarios or is it all the time? Um, is it just when someone's stressed out? Is it just when a specific person is there? Is it during just specific meetings or is it just before you have your coffee? All right, think of someone you'd like to give feedback to. Situation, the behavior and the impact. I do have a question from uh, Leanne Holtzberg about how it made me feel the impact. I will get into the feeling part of this later on, but for right now, I just wanna focus on situation, behavior and impact. First is the situation, very specific. Next, what specific behavior do I want to acknowledge or identify? Um, when you're late for work, when you speak to customers in that way, when your hours are not turned in Friday, where feedback goes off the rails, where it starts in on a fight or where there's emotional fallout is where we mix up the difference between judgments and behaviors. Judgments and behaviors. When I'm in judgment land, this is fight town. This is feedback that ends like the maiden voyage of the Titanic, the Hindenburg landing, whatever kind of disaster you want to put in your mind, this is where feedback goes off the rails. So to prove this, and this is where sometimes a lot of us, myself included, we make mistakes on this, uh, I'm going to play a little game. And so I know down at the bottom of your screen there, you have a raise hand function. So I'm going to show you some words, and I want you to raise your hand if it's a behavior. After I comment on it, I'm going to ask you to put your hands back down and we'll reset. I'm just going to show you a word, and if it's a behavior, raise your hand. Ready? Here we go. Here's the first one. Lazy. Behavior or judgment? Okay, so six people, five people, seven people, about seven of you or so, five of you thinking this is behavior. Okay, all five of you. You are wrong. I'm sorry, you just are, <laughs> just mean. Okay, uh, lazy, put your hands down, please. Lazy is not a behavior. And I know we might say, no, 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 I've seen lazy people, I know lazy. Um, perhaps the people are lazy, I'm not commenting on them. If we're trying to get people to change, and what I want to do is I need to talk about the behavior. So if I can describe lazy, and then the thing, next thing I'd ask you is, okay, well, what are they doing? Um, they didn't show up on time for work. Um, they didn't turn their work in on time. Um, they weren't there with the team when they were supposed to be there. All of those are the behaviors. It might be that they're lazy, but if I'm trying to give behavior change, then I need to specify what the behavior is. Um, this is a silly example, but on my team, I am not a, a reply all. And so if you said to me, um, hey, Matt, you're just lazy. You don't reply to all thank you when an email is sent. Um, now, we're, now we're in a contentious situation. Now I'm feeling defensive versus if you just said, hey, Matt, when you don't reply to all and let everyone know you received the email and you're thankful for it, I don't know that you got it and I don't know that it was helpful. That's something different and I can react to that. All right, next one. Raise your hand if it's a behavior. Missed team meetings. Miss team meetings. Yep, you're absolutely right. All of you raising your hands. Miss team meetings is a behavior. You can put your hands down. Next one, interrupt someone. Is that a behavior? Raise your hand. And again, you are correct. All of you raising your hands. That is a behavior. You can put your hands down, please. I feel like a school, I mean, a school kid, uh, school teacher here. How about rude? Rude. Is rude a behavior or judgment? If you think it's a behavior, raise your hand. No one is raising your hand and you're absolutely correct. Uh, the best example I can give for rude, uh, especially in cultural differences, and even if it were just different states in the US, but especially in different countries. And so if you do any work in Asia, I think the people know that the way you hand and receive a business card is with two hands. You, you give it with two hands, you receive it with two hands. And of course in America, how do we do that? Well, we just pull it out of our wallets, it's crumpled up, we probably write our correct cell number on it and we throw it across the table. Now, to someone, that might be really, really rude, but for us, it's just, okay, well, that's just us handing out uh, business cards. This is the reason why when you go to really high-end hotels, they'll walk around the desk and hand you your room key, perhaps your credit card back with two hands. But rude is without a doubt, that is a judgment. I'm trying to get the behavior is. How about you don't care about your work? Judgment or behavior? Raise your hand if you think it's behavior. In this case, people might not care about their work, but if I can describe what they're doing, it's always a judgment. I'm in judgment land if I can further describe what they're doing. So in other words, well, that person just doesn't care about their work, it's inapplicable. 
And you might actually, they might care deeply about it, but they haven't had the training or something like that. So don't care about your work as a judgment. Anytime I can look at something like this and define it in a behavior, it's in judgment land. How about late for work? Judgment or behavior? Raise your hand if it's a behavior. Yep, you're absolutely right. It is a behavior. My favorite story of this is I was running a basic training boot camp, and uh, one of my drill instructors arrived late, real early in the morning, like 4.30 a.m. We're all out there, thousands of us running, and he arrives late, and we'll call him Ski because that's his nickname, and Ski comes up, and he knows I'm a car guy, and so he, he, Ski says, I'm really sorry I'm late, sir. I had car trouble, and I said, well, what, what, what was the problem with your car? And he says, I wasn't in it on time. And I thought it was such a good excuse. Now we're laughing. I'm high five. I'm like, that's a good one, Ski. And then every, all my other guys are like, well, how come he's not in trouble? And I said, well, because he's funny. Okay, how about disagreeable? Judgment or behavior? Disagreeable. In this case, disagreeable is a judgment. Um, if they are disagreeing about something, then that's a behavior. But I would disagreeable means that I just don't like things. Go right back into that behavior. And the last one, and I'll just tell you what this one is, Engaged is a judgment. I know it's on the positive side of things, but engaged, if I want someone to do more of something, I need to list what the specific behavior is. All right, enough of me just japping at you here. I want you to jot down some more notes in your paper there. What specific behavior is the person exhibiting? And the more specific you can be, the better. What's the specific behavior that person is doing? So you're building your, you're building your feedback message, either developmental or appreciative, and you've already listed what the situation is, how it occurs, where it occurs. Now I've listed what the specific behavior is. Um, they were late, they missed the team meeting, um, they yelled at someone, um, they, it's another good one that I would say, um, they didn't turn their work in on time. What's the very specific behavior that person is exhibiting? All right, last one is the impact. And the impact allows the motivation or the context of why somebody would want to change. I listed the four main ones here. Time, energy, money, and the catch-all kind of fulfillment. But there's probably more there. But the impact is important because then the person can see, oh, that is my behavior. I can't disagree with it. I actually do that. And there it is an impact now. Now I'm providing all of those things. At this time, we did this behavior. It led to this impact. I need all three of those things. Just write down some notes there on what the impact might be. All right, the last one here. The last one is a ratio. And I know there's a lot of different studies on this. It's five to one. It's three to one. It's seven to one. Here's the main point. If you, let me back up. You were probably promoted into a leadership role or where you are because you're a great problem solver. And problem solvers, like myself, no different. I look for problems to solve. I do, I look for things that are going wrong. And I also, if you wanted to spin that in the positive sense, I look for things that can be improved. And so a lot of times I have to resist the urge to just, be, just go in and give a whole bunch of developmental feedback constantly. You become like the critic constantly. I'm going into a new area, this is wrong, this is wrong, this needs to be changed. Now I'm just giving feedback on what needs to be uh, developed or needs to be improved. If I haven't created the part about, I'm going to also catch you and I'm also going to point out what you're doing right. This is where people would say, you know, for X amount of time, I've been doing it all right, never heard a single thing. And then I do one thing wrong and I'm getting a whole bunch of feedback on me. That's why it doesn't live well. And remember that heat map I showed you where um, care personally and challenge directly, I'm going to be in the aggressive side of all I'm doing is giving developmental feedback messages all the time. Importantly, I'm not saying that we have to go around and give everybody a trophy and everybody gets a high five even if they're not doing their job. All I'm saying is, if you want to create a pathway of respect where people know that you, that you care about them, I need to also make sure they know when they're doing things right. And I'm gonna use the exact same formula, situation, behavior, and impact. As I do that and I'm catching them doing those things right and I'm constantly telling them you're doing a great job, I'm, I'm recognizing you for your contribution, then when it comes time that I need to say, hey, here's something we need to adjust, and they're just much more, um, they're much more receptive to that as you or I would be. The other part is it increases trust. One component of trust is compassion. Does the person care about me? One way I can tell someone that I care about them is I tell them when they did a great job. And by not just saying good job, but getting very specific. All right, after you deliver the feedback, importantly, number one, um, listen. There's a lot of reasons to do this, but it's probably when we work around the world and I'm doing work with either senior leader teams, 
or, or individual contributors, when I ask people, what do great leaders do? Well, almost number one will be listen. And so the first thing you should do when you deliver the feedback is listen. The next one, it could just be in being in a coaching situation. I'm just gonna ask you some open-ended questions about how you're feeling about this or what you think about the feedback. I'm gonna provide some time and space if needed. Um, I'm gonna ask for their feedback. Hey, here's the feedback, what do you think? Let them provide some feedback back. It might be like, oh, this is really tough, I'm gonna have to think about it, or I really appreciate it, or the last one here, it's always great, especially if you're in a leadership position, to acknowledge that perhaps you could be wrong. Um, I will tell you, I was running a small think tank, um, and I had a gentleman who I'd hired to be a speechwriter, very smart, very capable uh, person, pedigree education, impeccable record, um, just a really great thinker. And he was supposed to be a speechwriter. And I could tell that like, the work wasn't being turned in on time. It wasn't what I thought it was going to be. He was uh, kind of critiquing the rest of the team. The dynamic of this small, tight-knit team, about 20 people, was starting to erode. Now our customers are not happy with me. And so I just... I did everything I've talked to you about. I did entirely the wrong way. I just called him in. I pretty much said, I'm going to fire you unless you say yes, sir, to all the following response. I just started asking him questions. And I just started making statements. You're going to stop your critiquing. And he would say, yes, sir. You're going to start turn, turning your work in on time. Yes, sir. And I just lit into him. Like I'm on the aggressive scale. And I'm not even talking about what his behavior is. I just said, you're wrong. I'm right. Here's what you need to do. And so I listed out all the requirements of the job and what he was doing wrong. And so then at the end, there's a pause. And I'm usually kind of the happy, uh, kind of the happy guy. Like people don't really see me too angry. The whole team is hearing me outside my office chew this person out. And so I'm sure they're all in like shell shock. Like what's going on here? He is too. And at the end, I said, so what do you think? And he said, um, he said the phrase, do you have any idea how daunting it is to look at a blank sheet of paper and know that what I write is going to be on CNN by the end of the day? He never had any training on it. I didn't train him on it. So here I was giving him all this aggressive feedback about how he needs to perform better. And I realized I had equated a lot of his background with his ability to write speeches and he just wasn't trained in that. So that last one there, acknowledge that perhaps you as a leader giving the feedback, you could be wrong. So those are the steps after you deliver the feedback. So next steps for all of you as we wind this up and I'll open it up for questions and answer a couple of the questions that have come in and ask you for one more poll. Um, one is, you're going to ask for feedback from at least two people in your span of care. Ask them. You'll give them the gift of asking for their opinion, asking their input, ask for their feedback on your performance. Start to create that pathway. Ask for feedback from your leader on your performance. Hey, what can I do for you? But importantly, hey, what can I do better? What do you see in my performance? Perhaps it could be improved. Next one, write at least five affirmative feedback messages. The beauty of this skill set is it's the exact same formula. So if you want to get good at delivering feedback that is more directive in nature, just write it on the good side. It's the same formula, right? Five affirmative feedback messages. I want you to write a couple, uh, two developmental feedback messages. Importantly, when you do that, one thing I'd like you to think about is share that feedback message before you deliver it. Write it out, and if you need to change the name for HR purposes, whatever it might be, then change the name or don't even include the name. But share that feedback message with a colleague. Make sure you have the situation, the behavior, and the impact articulated. Tell the person a kind of a brief synopsis about what's going on and have, again, deliver it to them. Um, one, of the, one of the key criteria of effective teams, teams that are very effective, is psychological safety. And if we were to break that down and not get too sciencey on you, but basically it means teams that are able to ask for and receive help are more effective teams. They're higher performing, they meet obligations, they have a higher engagement scores, all of those things. Determine number one by can I ask for and receive help. When we do this work, even from senior leaders to frontline leaders, just about every time someone will read the feedback message, someone else in the group will say, here's how I would change it, or here's where I think it misses the mark, and the person goes, ah, oh, thanks, that's gonna make it even better. So I'm just offering, leverage the intelligence and the, and the passion you have in your own group and share it before you deliver it. Lastly, when you deliver feedback afterwards, ask for feedback literally on your feedback. I know it's a little inception point kind of thing, but this way you'll get better at giving it. Hey, I gave you some feedback. Was it helpful? Were you able to act on it? Or was it confusing or vague or whatever it might be? But just ask for feedback. How was it? Nice open-ended question. Those are the next steps. All right, as we wrap up, I'm gonna ask another poll question here though as I wrap this up and I'll start to get into a little bit of the Q&A. Let me give you another question here let me find it that is 
what if your organization, and I mean this sincerely, just I'm asking this, I'm gonna launch this out. What if your organization committed to delivering feedback in this way? It would, it'd be exactly the same, not change a thing. Um, it would run off the rails and turn into a Lord of Flies environment. It would inspire change, or I'm not exactly sure what would happen. I'm perfectly happy, but I'd like, the reason I'm asking for the poll is less feedback to me and more feedback to everyone that's in the group here uh, to see how we would think about this. And I'm probably going to end this just after a few seconds here. And I'll show you what you all said. Most of you said, yes, it would inspire uh, change. And a couple of them, one of you said, yeah, I'm not exactly sure. And that's fine. But I think for most people, when we see this in organizations, this type of feedback formula, it at least increases the receptivity of it. All right, last part of this. Uh, you can reach me at matt.wyatt at ccoleadership.com. Our book is Everybody Matters written by our CEO, Bob Chapman, and Raj Sisodia. Raj is a number of books that he's a tremendous author, an incredible gentleman, uh, who also did some work with John Mackey in the Conscious Capitalism Movement. If you uh, don't wanna read the whole book and you'd like a nice free resources, whether you're on Amazon Prime or YouTube, you can find it on, uh, you can find our documentary, Everybody Matters, and you can do a nice lunch learn. It's about 25 minutes, Raj is in the video, Bob's in the video. If you haven't gotten enough of me, and who knows, you can get more of me in that video even. Uh, or you can just go to our website, ccoleadership.com, and you can grab that. As I mentioned, we do this work with organizations all over the world, helping people build really, really thriving businesses and cultures and merging those two together in organizations you can be proud of. The last part I'm going to ask you to do, I'm going to ask you to run one more poll here. And in this case, I'm going to ask you for feedback to me, please. I'm going to send you a poll right now, and it's just basically on how did this webinar go for you? And so I would very much appreciate your feedback. And if you have any questions or answers, please put those in. And I'm gonna start reading some of these Q&A off as I run that poll. So number one was, hey, how about how it made me feel? Um, the impact of how it made me feel. If you wanna put in the feelings on this part, I think it's perfectly appropriate if you'd like to, and that goes more in the impact. So as an example, um, is an example that might be relevant would be, here's the situation that happened, here's the behavior that you did, and the impact is, um, I feel less confident that I can give you this job it might be. Um, I'm not gonna go so much as I'm, uh, I'm, I'm hurt or those type of things, but if I wanted to put the feelings in, I would put the feelings into the impact area. Do you, are you aware um, this is the impact you're having on people, and, and specifically uh, to the person who's delivering, I think that'd be a great idea, and that's where the feelings would be in there. Any other questions you all have, I'm happy to answer those as we wrap this webinar up. I know we were set to schedule for one hour. We wanted to run it for about, about 40 to 45 minutes and then be open to any type of questions you have. I'll keep chatting. I'm going to answer a couple other questions, then I'm going to get to, uh, to Dan's question here. One of the questions that came in from the last webinar was, hey, but what about the experience level? Like, shouldn't we change this? And this is a really interesting uh, question. And there's some, I think we'll adjust the next webinar we do on feedback to, uh, to show this. Studies will show in a lot of research shows that when someone's learning a new skill, in other words, when they have a new job, they need a whole bunch of, um, they need to build their confidence up. They're new at it, they're making mistakes. And so what they need is a lot of affirmative feedback. Hey, good job on this one, good job on this one. As someone gets more skilled in their job, what they actually want is more detailed feedback on how they can improve. And so if I were being ridiculous about this, I would say um, probably LeBron James, who's a basketball player in the United States, does not need feedback on he dribbles the ball really well. He probably wants some really discreet feedback on, I don't know, a triangle offense or something strategy within the game. But the question was, how do I adjust the feedback on the experience level? Man, increase the amount of affirmative feedback you have when someone's brand new at something, and then get much more refining your developmental feedback as they get the skill going, because that's what they really want is they want to get better at that. Okay, let's see some other feedback here and other questions. I'm going to read some of these off. Um, who do you think, I'm going to read this live, so I don't know if it's a good question or not, or if I'm going to just tell you, I don't know the answer, but here we go. Who do you think should be the first movers in creating a feedback culture by asking for feedback? Senior management, i.e. if they don't ask for it, why should I? Um, great point. And the answer is, I think if we are waiting for senior management, I mean this sincerely, if you're waiting for senior management to, to do something, um, I honestly, in the work that I do with organizations around the world, I think this is where we find organizations that are kind of stagnant. 
And so um, I'm not trying to be Gandhi here, be the change you want to see in the world, but I would offer if you're an organization and I have a senior leader team that's willing to, absolutely, I would say senior leaders, you are going to start asking for feedback. You're going to run a survey, we're going to run an online survey, and we have one that measures people, purpose, and alignment. And right afterwards, we're going to do some focus groups and you're going to just ask for feedback. You're not going to make excuses. So if I were choosing who's starting this, that would be it. But if you were like giving me a, just a complete whiteboard of where I'd start, I'd start with senior leaders and I would start with your frontline leadership. About 80% of most organizations, the front line, that's where it reports into. And so I would have the frontline leaders asking for a lot of feedback. By the way, there's a direct correlation between asking for this feedback and a learning organization and an innovative organization. Great question. Um, when is the next webinar? That's a great question. If I was a better planner, then I would tell you, but my team gives me feedback that I am not a good planner. I am not a good structural thinker, so I do not have another date. I didn't even know I could figure out the computer to make this one work. So we are going to put those dates on. This is a total shameless plug here. And you should go to ccoleadership.com to check that out. But we will put that on. I will be emailing. Oh, this is a great, uh, great point. You can subscribe on our website and I will be putting, um, I will be giving you all these slides that will be, it's recorded. So I'll be sharing this recording with you. I'll be giving you all the slides. You can contact me if you want anything else. If you'd like to receive updates on the kind of stuff that we're doing around the world, um, sign up. You can go to ccoleadership.com and you can hit a sign up button for uh, all the latest blog posts and webinars that we have. So that's possible. Okay, I have some other questions here. Um, okay, I have a person that says, I teach Listen Like a Leader. That's one of our core curriculum. And uh, thanks a ton for this webinar. It's excellent, very useful. It was not a question. I'm glad I wrote it off because it makes me feel very good. So thank you. Um, let's see what else we have here. Any kind of thoughts on Marcus Buckingham views on feedback in his book, Nine Lies, or perhaps this is a future debate. Um, you know, the part of Mar Marcus Buckingham, so I'm not going to get into a debate or his book on Nine Lies, but this is what I do want to say. So Marcus Buckingham is a great quote about uh, recognition, which is literally feedback on what someone's doing right. So one of his quotes is, you should find those people toiling away in relative obscurity in your organization. You could shine a light on them and hold them up. In other words, the people that are just doing the grind work day in and day out, I just shine a light on them and recognize them. So in a place where I would be in a complete agreement with Marcus Buckingham is, those are the people that need affirmative feedback. Um, it's a reason why if we're doing any events with any uh, third party, they're a catering company or they're a restaurant, I'm going to make sure we're pulling out the staff and thanking them in front of everyone. Here's a situation. This is behavior exhibiting for us, the care, and this is the impact it has on this meeting that we're having every single time, every single time. Those are a good example of people that are uh, toiling away in relative obscurity. Okay, um, do we have a culture of asking for questions? Let's see here, let me run this next question out here. Do we have a culture of asking for questions but actually not listening to it? How can one change that? Oh, this is a really good question. So the question is, if I have a culture of asking questions, but actually we don't listen to it, how can you change that? Um, that's a pretty deep one, and it could go into several levels here. That's a tough one just to answer succinctly. I know this is, I'm not trying to make it very simplistic, but I know in our organization, the organizations that we work with, it becomes very individualistic. And so if I'm in a meeting, especially the senior team, and I'll see that, I'll literally say, can I call your attention to the situation? Can I call attention to this is one of the meetings we're having. You just had a frontline leader who is closest to the work and they were talking to you about some possible improvements. That's the situation. The behavior I saw from you all is you immediately open up your computers and we're typing. I know one of you was doing email. That's the behavior. The impact of that that I see as an outside consultant and you're paying me money to be here, the impact that I see is frontline people that are closest to the work, they're not gonna give you their ideas. Without their ideas, you're not going to improve in your organization. So unless you change your behavior when people are trying to actually ask you questions or to give input to you, then you're not going to get those great answers. And no matter how much you spend on a consultancy, it will not change. And so I would go right back into this behavior. One, um, one episode, one situation at a time where we see as all of a sudden, it's, what's the magic bullet that changes this? There isn't one. It's one situation at a time. I'm going to focus on behavior and impact. It's as free as I can. Okay, what else do we have here? Okay, I'm gonna to go to uh, some Q&A. 
I fully support, this is, a, this is another uh, a question here. I fully support Everybody Matters and trying hard to build it as office, but I am told to stop because it's not my job. So it's bothering me. The CEO wants change management. The lowest level wants it, but the layer between us is holding us back. I am struggling. Any advice would be great. Okay, here's my advice. Um, hire Chapman and Co-Leadership Institute. We will come in and we will fix them all. That's the easy answer, right? Um, that's a tough one. Um, I'll be honest with you. I think number one is you definitely, for, for work we do, if we want to see some momentum, we need some kind of C-suite um, sponsorship. So the fact that you have a CEO that believes in this, I think it's very powerful. Um, if I were in your shoes, and I'm not trying to give advice, it's just things to think about. That middle layer of leadership is always difficult because they're having to handle the strategic planning portion. They're having to translate this is the goals of the organization, and this is how they actually get done. So the linkage between the work getting done and people in the C-suite saying this is what we should do. So they're in a tough position, and so it might be that they actually want the change, they just don't know how to get there. And so one piece I would offer is providing feedback to the CEO exactly in this situation, behavior impact, but not saying it in a generic statement of, hey, I want this philosophy of culture, but I can't get it. I would be very specific on what's the behavior you see and allow that CEO to be more, um, allow him or her to be more discreet about, oh, that's a behavior you're exhibiting, that's behavior you're seeing. And I know that's not a great answer to this, and if you'd like to email me, we can get more uh, information on the very specifics of your organization. I'm happy to provide some help there or provide some perspective. All right, any other questions you'd like to have out here? I'm going to look through here and see if I've missed anything on the chat room as well. Um, what are my thoughts on the implementation of this material and mindset into a company culture when it comes to those within an organization to be closed off to it and may not fall in line with the company or the culture the company is trying to nurture or maintain? I'm going to try and read between the lines here. So what are our thoughts on the implementation of this kind of material and mindset in an organization that actually is closed off to it? I'm not exactly sure, honestly, how to answer. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how to answer that question. Um, I would say that uh, all culture is local, and so it depends on in the organization. I might have pockets that are open to this. I'd certainly try and work an experiment, or I try and work there, and allow that to be the um, allow that to be the example for others. But it's hard for me to say: Is there a culture that doesn't believe in this? I think sometimes if it's wrapped up in the quote unquote culture and soft skills versus here's a really, really great way to increase business performance. If we're giving feedback, here's a formula that allows us to be better in a performance management system kind of thing. And so I think where we see it sometimes, quote unquote, not be adopted is when the communication around it is very soft and, hey, can we not hurt each other's feelings, which is perfectly fine. I don't want people to feel cared for, but some cultures, I think most organizations, they want to get better, faster, cheaper, more efficient. And this is a really good performance tool. And if I need to sell it on that way, uh, that's kind of the angle I go for. And I'd look for some of the believers that are able to work with this. Uh, one of the responses to the questions, thanks, but it is not easy in all caps. Um, I would agree. It depends on um, what organization you're in. Uh, wondering who a few companies are that stand out for you that have implemented effective feedback cultures. Um, that's a really good question. I think uh, within Barry Waymiller, I think there are certainly some uh, that have done a really great job at this. I think we work with some major airlines that do a really nice job at this. There's a couple of private retailers that I think do a really nice job at this, and I'll just list one of them. I think Meyer Foods is an organization that's really working to implement this, uh, and they've seen some really dramatic results, uh, both retention, engagement, higher customer satisfaction scores. They would be an organization I would hold up and say, they've really done some good work on this. Um, the San Francisco 49ers, I think the business end of this, they've done some really great work uh, on this as well. Um, Southwest Airlines, is a, I'm a fan of, and I think they do a very nice job um, in this area as well. So those are a few companies. Do you see that, say, 10% of any company will not adopt this, adopt this culture? I would say in our practice, it's, it's the lowest level team members who are the 10% are. Okay, 10%, uh, that's a tough one. And it would depend on what the company is, the large, the size, the CEO. There's so many factors. I don't know that even if I statistically said, here's the percent of people who quote unquote adopt this culture, um, and I'm not trying to be harsh on any of the attendees here, but if I'm literally saying to myself, who or who has not adopted the culture, I'm a little in judgment land already. 
And so it's hard for me to give you a statistic to say, here's a percentage. Um, I know that a lot of people, oftentimes, it's rare that I find people who come to work every day and they actually don't want to do a good job. Um, they actually want to be subversive to the culture. I just find that a lot of times people either don't know how or they're in a system that doesn't allow them to do this kind of work in a way that they can. And so I know it's a little bit of a cop out, but I just wouldn't say um, whether someone adopts the culture or not. Okay, as I mentioned, I'm rolling up on time here, but as mentioned, we'll provide these slides, all the materials to everyone who signed up. And if you'd like to sign up for more updates and other things that we have going on, other webinars, blog posts, please sign up at ccoleadership.com. Really appreciate to all of you who attended and have a good evening, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Thanks, bye.